everyone, and welcome once again to Reverb. My name is Calvin Pollock, and I'm joined on the mic by my co-host and co-producer, Alex Helberg. Hey, Alex. Hey there, Calvin. How's it going? Going good. And we are going really good today because we're excited to be joined by two returning guests and one first-time guest. We have with us here today Dr. John Otto, Associate Professor of English at Carnegie Mellon University. Hey, John. Hello. Thanks for having me. We have heavy hitter return guest, Dr. Cameron Mozafari, who is a senior lecturer in Cornell University's Engineering Communications Program. Hey, Cameron. How's it going? And finally, first time guest, very excited to have Alexandra Kirsch, who is a technical writer and a Master of Arts in Professional Writing from Carnegie Mellon University. Hey, Alexandra. Hello, I'm excited to be here. And we are so excited because this is really kind of a meeting of the minds for all of us here, where the project that we're going to be discussing today is a publication you all just put out in Discourse and Society, which is entitled Sustaining or Overcoming Distance in Representations of U.S. Drone Strikes. And this is a project that, as far as we understand, came about because of us because of reverb is that is that true john i don't i don't know if we want to take all the credit for it but but john if you would if you would be so kind as to explain yeah so it actually in some ways it starts with you calvin so well it starts with me and before you i guess because i, I was sure. interested in, <laughs> right. in in gathering sort of news reports and remember you and i calvin were working once upon a time on collecting news reports and trying to see just about U.S. drone strikes in places like Yemen and Pakistan and Somalia between roughly 2004 and probably when we started, it was like 2015. Exactly. Um, eventually, I extended that to 2017. And you and I, and I think we were working with Hannah Ringler, and we never published this work, but we were looking at sort of attributions and sourcing in these news stories about drone strikes. And we gathered a lot of them. They were uh, in places like ABC and NBC and CBS and the New York Times and Los Angeles Times and the AP, et cetera, et cetera. And so I had this big corpus that I was still working with after we put that sort of sourcing project aside. And I started to notice all of these headlines in news, newspaper articles that said things like, U.S. drone strike kills one person. And that was happening a lot. <laughs> U.S. drone strike kills six people. U.S. drone strike kills six, Right. And I started to ask myself this question, like, I wonder what happens in people's heads, what they picture when they hear or read a headline like that. And I decided to start pursuing that question. And so I was reading around in cognitive linguistics and reading around about mental simulations and how those happen and how they're invoked by language. And I was like, wouldn't it be cool to start like trying to draw pictures of what I think people are seeing in their heads when they hear a headline like this. And so I reached out to Alex, Alex Kirsch, and said, hey, you're good at drawing, right? Can you draw pictures? And the two of us worked for a while, you know, kind of like, well, when you read this sentence here, this is what I'm seeing in my head. What are you seeing in your head? Could you try to start drawing it out? And we're trying to kind of loosely go on like the theories I was talking about from cognitive linguistics and mental simulation. And we realized very quickly that we were in over our heads, that I had taught myself cognitive linguistics, but I wasn't an expert. And then I remembered the Reverb podcast. And I knew about Cameron because of your podcast. And I think, I don't know if we were following each other already on Twitter, Cameron, but if we were, it was only because of the Reverb podcast. Well, and I think you were co-guests on our anniversary uh, episode. Yes, that's, that's right. right. That's we right. Were on Correct. The, yeah, that's right. We were on the anniversary episode. I don't think we were on it at the same time, but we were on the same episode. And so I was like, I should reach out to Cameron. And I, I approached Alex about this. She loved the idea. Reached out to Cameron and said, hey, are you interested in working on this project? This is what we're thinking about. And Cameron was like, yeah, I'm in. And then for, I don't know. A year or two, we were working like once a week, hour long sessions that sometimes seemed longer of just like this slog of an analysis, drawing these really detailed diagrams, which by the way, all the diagrams that you see in the article were composed by Alex Kirsch. And uh, there were so many more diagrams that didn't get published that she made that were amazing. Um, and that's how we kind of did our analysis, kind of sentence by sentence, working through these news reports, 
uh, drawing pictures to try to help us conceptualize what was going on. And eventually, you know, here we are now, it got published and it's, it's a story that involves everybody but you, Alex Helberg. So uh, <laughs> you, you contributed hey, nothing well, to this project. Zero. I seem I seem to remember combing through a uh, being a data custodian for a spreadsheet that had about eleven thousand lines or so of speech attribution verbs. Did that count for nothing in your mind, John? Well, it amounted to nothing in terms of publications. So okay, all right. In, okay. So in the in, way the universities work, it amounts to nothing. Nothing it doesn't matter. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I did get I did get get paid a healthy stipend for that work, so you're not going to hear me complaining. Mm -hmm. um, but I. <laughs> No, I appreciate you laying out that the the lineage of how this all came together first, because I think it's, you know, for any other scholars who are listening right now, this is sometimes how co-authorship opportunities come about. This is the way that those kinds of connections are made. And, uh, and I really also appreciate, I think once we get into the granular parts of your analysis, people are going to appreciate a lot more the amount of time and collaborative effort you all spent putting, putting every part of this together, because it really comes through uh, in these multimodal channels of how you present this newspaper reporting on drone strikes in a very, very strong way. So we wanted to ask, just in terms of the kind of scope of the project and what you see as its significance, why is it so important to understand the effects of what you're calling here distance? First and foremost, what do you mean by uh, the construals of rhetorical distance in news coverage for U.S. war victims? And just in general terms, we'll get into the specifics of it, but in broad strokes, what does your case study reveal about the role of distance in maintaining or potentially dismantling the U.S. war machine? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, I think, you know, there are two terms maybe I would... Distance is one of them, the other is suffering, right? So let's actually start with the the latter term, right? We take for granted, and there's a lot of people who take for granted that suffering is kind of a political cause, that when people are suffering, they shouldn't be suffering, right? And if you can stop the suffering, you should do so. And anytime suffering is happening somewhere in the world, it's a cause for some kind of action, or at least it can be. Um, the problem that we all face as humans is that there's so much fucking suffering going on all over the world. Some of it very close to home, some of it very far away. And so distance becomes a really important mediating factor in terms of the politics of suffering, right? What kinds of suffering do we see as close enough to do something about? Whose suffering seems familiar enough to matter, right? And so a basic premise that we start with is in order to do something about suffering, you first of all have to notice it. It has to be made present for you, close to you, and you have to care about it. Right. And there's a tremendous amount of scholarship that, uh, starting with maybe Luke Boltansky, that talks about distance and suffering, the politics of pity, uh, being moved emotionally by the suffering that you see uh, is one way of kind of uh, uh, motivating a politics. And the obvious sort of connection to war is that uh, people suffer. That's sort of the, the big thing that war does. In fact, it's probably the most newsworthy aspect of war in some ways, if you think about journalism. Why does war matter? Because it's the tremendous suffering that it causes. And the question becomes, whose suffering are we supposed to care about? Which victims matter? And which victims, to put it in the other term, which victims are brought close to us along any number of dimensions such that we care about them enough to stop their suffering? Cameron, Alex, you want to add anything to that? Yeah, and so I mean, we were we we're interested in in figuring out like so distance suffering is a is a is a concept that seems like it's pretty transparent, but then when you once you start looking at actual coverage of news stories having to do with in our case a drone strikes, you start to see ways that writers are making conscious choices to include or not include people because the ways that we pay attention to people and the kinds of tropes that you find within news discourse aligns you to be the kind of person who cares about or doesn't care about. So it's not just a matter of like my experiential feeling, but your experiential feeling is part of this language that gets used specifically for news stories in order to learn about other people. So understanding that the distant suffering in particular is a, a major part of uh, coverage of, of news stories gives us a, a way to, to kind of add to your second question, Alex, it gives us a way to, you know, dismantle the war machine or at least figure out like how we're being positioned and the ways that we're processing 
language and getting our information, how are we being positioned to care about or not care about people? So I'm really glad you brought that up, Cameron, this idea of how we're positioned as readers, as audiences for this kind of coverage, and in certain ways, how it conditions thought, I think, is is a really important question. And it leads me to what I wanted to ask about next, which is really the theoretical grounding of this study. So you all build on work in cognitive linguistics and discourse analysis from scholars such as Paul Chilton and Piotr Sop, two names that we've mentioned at various times on our Extremely Nerdy podcast. You also refer to the work of Lily Chuliarki. So how have these writers and other scholars helped you to theorize the ways that language affects political thought? And in particular, what is dyxis? Dyxis is a really key concept here, and why is it so crucial to understanding coverage of drone strikes? So one of the people that we build a lot on is, is Lily Chuliarki, as you mentioned. And she wrote a book in 2006. I think it's called The Spectatorship of Suffering. She's very much ans- asking and answering the kinds of questions that we're asking and answering, like uh, what kinds of stories uh, sort of motivate us to care uh, about sufferers. She looks at like you know natural disasters like earthquakes that take place across an ocean and uh, what kinds of stories make us care about those victims and what kinds of stories don't. The sort of dimension that we wanted to add to this was let's look at this from a cognitive linguistic perspective. Uh, and that's where Chilton's work becomes uh, really foundational for us. So Chilton has this theory called the he used to call it the discourse space theory, and then he changed it to the deictic space theory. I think his 2004 book on political discourse, where he called it discourse space theory. Now it's deictic space theory. In both cases, it's anchored in this kind of deictic language. So deictic language is essentially language that indexes or points to elements of the context, particularly like space, time, and person. The, the most obvious kinds of examples would be like words like here versus there, now versus then, I versus you or we versus them, right? So if I say I, I mean me. And if you say I, you mean you, right? So they, they're they very much anchored to the context. They point to different kinds of groups uh, and we can use them really in creative ways, right? So like right now we're all literally in different locations. But if I say here, I can sort of create a a mental space for us to think about us all being in one central location, even though physically we're not. And we can do that along all those dimensions and of time, uh, space. uh, And Chilton adds another dimension, which is modality, which we can also uh, get into. But essentially, the idea is that uh, discourse is going to uh, sort of create. a deictic center. And the deictic center starts with the self, the author, and whoever the author considers a part of us, usually the addressee. And that deictic center is going to be I or we, right here, right now. And it's also going to be that which is true and that which is right. And then the discourse is also going to create or construe a world of other entities uh, that are positioned relative to the deictic center, right? So the furthest away from us would be them. (laughs) The furthest away from here would be way, way over there. And you can also, in time, the furthest from now would be far into the future or far into the past. What Chilton does that's also interesting, he talks about modality, both epistemic and deontic modality, as also being metaphorically conceptualized in these spatial terms. So that things that are untrue might be uh, far from the truth, right? The truth is near us, or something that is only contingently possible is a remote possibility. And the same thing with values, right? Things that are wrong are considered far away from here and now, which is true and right. So this is the basic idea that here, now, true, right, us, that's where we all are located. And we kind of build that up in the in the course of an ongoing kind of discursive communication. And then all sorts of other entities can be made to seem close or far from us on all of these dimensions. And of course, we can imagine that um, certain entities that are other are going to be made to seem further away from us 
and they're going to be made to seem more wrong than us on sort of deontic scales as well. Yeah, if I can join in here too, all of that is is exactly right. And I I think that one of the things that's really important to emphasize, maybe for a rhetorical audience, audience of rhetoricians, is that we're looking at language. And oftentimes when people think about looking at language, they think about looking at like words in a sentence or like, you know, is this grammatical or ungrammatical? And what we're trying to point out is that language also does another thing, which is a kind of, it, it situates you. So when I teach, you know, semantics and pragmatics, semantics, you're kind of learning what semantic space is, what, how, how meaning is constructed, et cetera, et cetera. But when we're talking about pragmatics, we're talking about how utterances actually have effects in the world, right? So when I say like, you know, I declare war, me, Cameron Mozafari, can't really do that. So the I, the personal likes doesn't have the same effect as, you know, if Joe Biden says I declare war. So we, we put value into these things, who that I is, how, how we kind of fill in the value there too. So whose didactic centers matter? So if we're representing other people too, not just, you know, our didactic center is a here and now, but if somebody else is talking about their didactic center as a here and now, can we actually relate to those people? Kind of getting back to that point of distant suffering. Is that person's experience of that I or experience of that place? Is that place familiar or experience of that time? Can I remember that time? Or something that happened earlier in the discourse or the social context, right? So all these things are, are things that we do with language to anchor it into a real position or place so that we can like make meaning of it, which isn't to say, you know, semantics doesn't do that too. It's to say that when we're, we're trying to anchor language in something that we can experience in the world, we're learning about the world and doing that too. And that's, that's kind of the, the point that we're making in the paper too. It's, you know, when we when we read this language, when we hear this language, we create that kind of mental world that we then anchor into our actual mental representations of the world. Yeah, this is really helpful. And I want to linger here just for a second, because this is, this is a very heady conversation. We're talking about Dykes's. I mean, one thing that, that's been helpful for me in pinning down what we mean by this is that it's always in the context of a given discourse artifact or or discursive utterance, right? So when we talk about the context, it's not just any context, it's language that points to the context that's relevant to that utterance or that artifact. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. It's a common ground. Like the Dyktic Center is a common ground that speaker and addressee share. And we right. point to that common ground, sometimes really explicitly with Dyktic pronouns. Sometimes we use kind of sort of our frame based knowledge to kind of figure out what what's sort of common and familiar. But yeah, it, that's that's exactly right. And I and I wanted to ask Alex Kirsch a question here about given that this is a discourse space theory, there was probably a lot that went into constructing the visuals for this article and for this study. So how do you think about Dexis, I guess, when you're designing these kinds of visualizations? That's a great question. I think I think it goes back to what what John just mentioned about how the the didactic center exists between the speaker and the addressee. So in the case of these articles, the speaker would be the authors, the journalists who wrote the articles, and the addressee would be the person reading them. So when I'm thinking of the didactic center specifically as it applies to the addressee or the reader, I am I'm almost envisioning like like a like an X, Y, Z axis coming from the center of the reader. Like I'm just envisioning, you know, the Y axis coming through their head, the X axis going across their hearts and then the Z in the other direction or whatever. And, and that's, they're reading it from that point of view there. The we, the here is the moment that they're reading the article. The, sorry, the now is the moment that they're reading the article. Here is where they are in relation to what's happening in the article. And real is a, what they're feeling as they're reading it almost. And so, so that's kind of what I stuck with. And then as Cameron mentioned, you also have the didactic center of the people who are suffering. They have their own access as well. And as you're reading about them, as the addressee is reading about them, the didactic center of the sufferers is kind of moving in time, either getting closer to the person reading it or getting farther away, depending on the language that's being used in the articles. 
Yeah, I think that's an incredibly helpful, I mean, it almost necessitates, like Calvin said, it can get a little bit heady when you're just talking about this in the context of like certain utterances, but when you actually map it out in a visual aid, and we'll encourage our, our listeners to go out and take a look at them as well, so that they can understand exactly all of the work that you put into this, Alex, which is really, really kind of amazing. I wanted to kind of pivot to talking a little bit more about the specific context in which you are applying deictic pronoun analysis or any of these other uses uses of deictic space or discourse space, however conceived, specifically asking about what additional dimensions did you add to it, and why did you feel that this was necessary, specifically given that we're talking about this context of international journalism, right, of reporting on events that are happening far, far away from the deictic center of the readers who are reading it. What did you add, and why did you feel that that was important? Sure. So, as we said, Chilton's original model starts with space, time, and modality, right? So things that are far or close from us in physical and sort of social space, things that are far or close to us in time, and things that are far or close to us in terms of their reality status, whether they're right or wrong, true or false. We we didn't really necessarily add things that weren't already somehow present elsewhere in literature, but we kind of, Chilton always said, these are not the only dimensions, right? There are other dimensions too. I'm just for the sake of simplicity, going to stick to these three. And if you think about Alex's job of trying to diagram this, once you create eight dimensions, you can't really show that anymore. And we did run into that issue as we were trying to conceptualize these. But one of the things that Chilton talks about in terms of space is that space extends from what he calls peripersonal space, which is the space right around your body, all the way to extra personal space that could be thousands or millions of miles away, right? And a lot of studies of discourse space theory have tended to think of space at a geopolitical scale. So like how one nation state encroaches on the space of another nation state. What I was interested in, what we were interested in, was thinking about space at a very local scale, right? So the space around your body, when you are, when a, when a writer is depicting a scene and you're asked to kind of observe it, what are you seeing kind of in your mind's eye? Or what are you simulating through a whole host of sensory kinds of apparatuses that are, exist in your brain, right? That That's something that we wanted to get to. And we decided, well, what if we just called this a sort of separate dimension? We, what if we just called this sensory space? The things that we can apprehend directly with our senses, that's very different from like thinking about what's going on on the other side of the world, right? I can't literally see right now what's going on in Pakistan but I can literally see my desk and my lamp and all these things around us. And language can get us to think in terms of what's going on in Pakistan and take this cartographer's view of the world. Or it can say, we're in Pakistan, we're on the ground, and right in front of us, you know, is Mama Nabibi's sandal on the ground. That's a very close sensory kind of experience. We're asked to visualize something from maybe even a few feet away, or we're asked to hear things or prompted, maybe not asked, prompted uh, to hear things from you know, from uh, in this kind of depicted world, you know, a few a few feet or a few miles away. So that's the first kind of sort of wrinkle we added, this, this notion of sensory space. And so things that are close, like taste and touch, that would be the most proximal kinds of things. You actually have to have them on or in your body, right? And then with vision and auditory kinds of experiences, those could be close or far away, depending on how the language directs you. The next dimension that we added was and again, we didn't invent this. This came from Kopi Tosca's work was emotional distance. Once again, we have language where, you know, we can think of things if we're very, being very objective and clinical, we can say we're detached, right? Or you could say, I really care about this person. I'm attached to them. So we have language that sort of metaphorically tells us that this kind of spatialization of emotion is already happening. Things that are significant emotionally are close to us. Things that are insignificant are detached from us, distant from us, at a remove from us. So we also wanted to get into that. What kinds of things are made emotionally significant and close and what things are made emotionally distal? And the last element, and again, this is, the roots of this are right in Shilton's work, has to do with sort of narrative perspective. Um, the difference between being a direct participant in something. Uh, we give the example in the text of studies where you're presented with a sentence like, you are slicing a tomato or imagine you are slicing a tomato. And when you get a sentence like that, you imagine yourself holding a knife and slicing a tomato, right? You're a first person participant. Uh, if I give you a sentence like she is slicing a tomato, you're much more likely to be an outside perceiver, right? So inside versus outside, close versus removed, 
And what we found, and this anyone who's read a novel knows this, is that even when you're getting those third person kinds of narrations about somebody else's life, the more you stick with the character, the more you're told details about their internal worlds and their kinds of personal perspectives, the more likely it is that you start to transport yourself into their psyche to hold for moments or sometimes extended periods of times their deictic center and see the world through their eyes and feel the world through their sort of bodies. That's at least vicariously possible, right? So that again is another sort of dimension of distance, right? Are we a distant observers of what's going on or does the language invite us, prompt us, or if you want to be really dangerous about it, coerce us into taking somebody else's perspective and sort of imagine the world in a firsthand sort of way. So I'm just going to add on to that for a second as well, because I think one of the things that John's doing is not emphasizing what what's new about this, because while he's right, other people have talked about this, and Chilton does allow for people to add to his tactic space theory, discourse space theory, with various mentions. It's it's kind of really important to point out that these are all places that we're looking for ways to categorize language that gets used to talk about distant suffering. So this is like a good toolkit specifically for looking at the ways that people are being made close to us uh, as they suffer, or they fail to be made close to us as they suffer. And so with this toolkit, you can do a lot of great analysis of ways that representations of war happen or representations of suffering happen and how effective those representations are. And it seems like this is a project that should be something that a lot of rhetoricians care about. But I, I think that one of the things that we're trying to emphasize here is that we have a, a, a method, a, a kind of toolkit that helps us to do this analysis. The yeah. only the only caveat being that you need somebody like Alex Kirsch to be able to really draw some shit <laughs> because it's not easy to do this analysis without also diagramming these things and dimensionalizing yes. them kind of graphically using that Cartesian system of axes. So yeah, it's it's a difficult toolkit to implement, but absolutely a, a really cool heuristic for thinking about language. Yeah, absolutely. So so you all went from like three dimensions to six dimensions. Is that do I have that right? I guess so. Yeah. I mean <laughs> and now I have to say like so we weren't able to to draw six dimensions of space. Right. So we had to get clever and say, well, let's color code things that are close to us emotionally in green and things that are distant in this other color, right? So we kind of had to figure out ways of showing closeness and remoteness in two dimensions. But we did try to account for all six. We did want to ask about, you know, just to concretize this, right? So bringing in the dimension of sensory closeness, emotional closeness, narrative closeness, how does this help us to understand your case study in this article? So overall, uh, your analysis finds significant differences in how the Associated Press, on the one hand, and the American Prospect, on the other, reported on a particular drone strike. You're looking at this drone strike in Pakistan in October of 2012, in which the U.S. military killed Mamana Bibi, a 68-year-old woman tending her garden. So just at a broad level, I wondered if you could just introduce the case study for us, and then we'll talk about some specific language in it. Yeah. So what we wanted to do, you know, like I said, we had this big corpus, but to do this kind of work, we knew we had to zero in on something small. And we decided the best way to kind of get at what language allows us to do, or maybe prompts us to do, would be to take two really extreme cases. So the one case is the AP reporting. So this is a report about the drone strike that you just mentioned that happened within a day of the attack. And it's very minimalist. It's The headline is uh, US drone strike kills at least one person. And the rest of the article kind of sounds just like that, <laughs> right? It's It's meant to be minimalist. And there are a lot of reasons why it's minimalist. But this is the more typical kind of reporting, as you'll recall, Calvin, from when you gathered the corpus and Alex, when you were reading through all of these uh, sourcings, right? It's it's very typical to get these kind of on the back pages stories that are like U.S. drone strike kills six, drone strike kills one. And, and recalling and keeping in mind that people often don't read past those headlines anyway, uh, you get a very schematic look at what's going on uh, in these drone strikes. The other article that we chose to compare this to uh, was the American prospect. So about a year after this strike, human rights reports started calling it out as a potential war crime because 
the only person who was apparently targeted and killed, as you said, was this 68-year-old grandmother, Mama to Bibi, who was tending her okra garden next to her grandchildren, right? There was no one else even around. And so there was a huge outcry because she was in some ways the perfect victim in the sense of having being totally innocent. There's no reason why this person should be killed, right? So after human rights reports kind of got hold of this story, as you can imagine, they wanted to profile it as a way of showing the injustices of the U.S. drone program. And then certain news outlets, and the American Prospect is one of them, started to tell the story in a bit more detail. In fact, in a lot more detail. And so when you read the American Prospect story, you get this very different kind of reporting that isn't U.S. drone strike kills one person, but well, we can look at the lead. Uh, yeah. So I was thinking that we could read from the two leads and then have you all kind of jump in and, and break them down. So the AP article, as you indicated, it's very clinical. It begins, quote, a U.S. drone fired a pair of missiles at a mud brick compound near Pakistan's border with Afghanistan on Wednesday, killing at least one person, intelligence officials said. Unquote. That's the AP lead. Then the American Prospect article is, quote, two beams of light came down from the drone lingering over the field where they had been gathering okra and hit Nabila's grandmother, Mamana Bibi. The earth shuddered. Nabila fell. Terrified, she stumbled into a run. Blood was gushing from her arm. She wrapped her red chadar head covering around the shrapnel wound. Moments later, it was soaked through. Unquote. So those are the two leads. Take us through kind of what you see there in terms of discourse space. Yeah, I think the first thing that we point to in the article is to do with specificity. You heard me use the word schematicity a moment ago. So Ronald Langaker talks about this kind of scale between really specific language and really schematic language. It's not exactly the same as concrete versus abstract, but it's somewhat similar. So he gives an example like object, tool, hammer, claw hammer. That's going from the very schematic pole to the very specific pole. And if you see a hammer lying around, you could factually say, hey, would you hand me that object? Just as well as you could say, hey, could you hand me that claw hammer? Do you say so, that a lot, John? You know what? I actually tell my <laughs> students this story. When I was in my <laughs> 20s and I was still living at home, I was sitting in my living room. My mom was in the kitchen and I heard this tremendous clatter come from the kitchen, a huge noise, like things had fallen, something bad had happened. I was like, what was that? And my mom goes, the thing got wrapped around the thing and then it fell. <laughs> oh. She was imagining maybe that I was Classic. able to see things from her eyes in a way that I wasn't. That was very schematic language. I had no idea what the fuck my mom was talking about, but she did because people do do this in context, right? So the first thing we notice about the AP story is that it uses very schematic language. Even the victim there, at least one person, putting aside the fact that we're getting this kind of scalar of at least one person is probably the most schematic way you could refer to a person, <laughs> right? Like. <laughs> I guess you could categorize them as an object or, you know, something like that. But it's not a very detailed way of construing the victim of the attack, right? And you see this throughout the AP story. You see that the entity that does the killing, the drone, or in the headline, the drone strike, is also very schematic. It's rendered in a way that you're not really supposed to look at the details. And you also notice in the lead that kind of like, what was the language, Calvin, about where they kind of geographically locate it. Yeah, near near Pakistan's border with Afghanistan. Right. So immediately when you get that language, you kind of have to step back and look at it from uh, a cartographer's view. You're at 30,000 feet and you're looking at a map with borders, right? So the whole article, and even you can even imagine rendering this sentence from the drone's, drone's point of view, right? The drone fired missiles at a mud, mud brick compound. In some of my kind of uh, unofficial work on this, I had people read the sentence and I asked them, what did you see? And a lot of the people in their kind of mind's eye, at least as they reported to me, said, I'm in the drone. <laughs> I'm seeing the missiles fire at this mud brick compound. And this language invites that and then invites you to step back even further to see the borders of Afghanistan and Pakistan, to see the victim as just a person without any uh, defining details whatsoever. When you get to the American prospect, it's like night and day, right? The first thing that I would point to is actually something we didn't write about in the article, but we talked about it, right? That action, two beams of light came down, specifically the verb phrase came down, right? The difference between came down and went down is something that I think about. And I know Cameron 
you probably thought about this too, right? Like to say went down, you take the drone's perspective. They went down from the drone to the earth. As soon as you say came down, you're telling the readers or prompting them to say you're on the ground. It's coming down towards you, right? That's an amazing sort of a small grammatical or, or semantic feature that immediately is telling you this is a different kind of story. We're not going to see it from the drone's point of view. We're going to see it from the ground. And we're going to have characters that aren't just people, but they have names like Mamana and Nabila, and they have bodies, right? And they have clothing, and their bodies get wounded in specific ways, and you actually see blood gushing uh, in your mind's eye, right? And the other piece that I'll just touch on briefly is like, in the first one, it's you get this trailing attribution of officials said, right? And the AP article is like that throughout. So there's this contingency involved in like, according to these sources who we don't know and who aren't you and me, this is what happened. When you get to the American prospect, it's just pure categorical fact. Two beams of light came down, period. And they killed mom and a baby, this person who has a body, right? And then, of course, there's the emotional dimension, which... I mean, I was, as you were reading, I was actually getting goosebumps again, just thinking about this story. It's so horrific, and you're immediately drawn into the the life world, for lack of a better term, of Nabila, this, at the time, nine-year-old child who's terrified and stumbling into a run as her grandmother was just murdered in front of her eyes. Taking that kind of perspective and getting that kind of emotional proximity is extremely unlikely in the AP story, right? But the American prospect almost coerces you into imagining the world and having those kinds of emotional reactions. Yeah, I mean, I think John hit all the major points. I mean, basically, one of the things that we wanted to show is like, these are two representations of the same event. Like, schematically, they look exactly the same. It's the same event. You're construing the same event. But how you're construing it, that's that's how, that's that's really what matters here. So, right, there's there's that kind of point about attribution. Is this true or false? You know, we have to continually check to see if these 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 utterances are, are true or false. That's something that you see in reporting as a kind of convention, sure. And it's it's meant to be there for a reason. But when we look at the American prospect, we we get a very different perspective. It's not you know, the drone's perspective, but it's one where we're watching a scene. It's kind of very cinematic and narrative driven. And sure, we can just say like, oh yeah, you, the, the narrative driven thing is more effective than the thing that sounds like reporting, but you don't really get a good idea of like, what is the thing that is making us not recognize that somebody was just murdered? Like, what is the thing that's not getting us to care about the thing that's actually being reported on. And if we're not caring about the thing that's being reported on, why are we reading this news, right? We need we need a better kind of way of representing distant suffering in order to make this meaningful at all. Yeah, the only thing that that made me think of was the, the kind of work on boring war that's been done in war rhetoric studies in the last, you know, five, 10 years, where a lot of this wire service reporting on U.S. conflict is almost written not to be read as much as it is written to be read. Most of the stories, as I said, are these kinds of episodic stories like the AP story. And they're typically published on the back pages of the newspaper. They rarely find themselves on page A1, right? And what our research shows is that, like, first of all, that doesn't have to be the case. Like, any anybody suffering could be put on page A1 above the fold, or anybody suffering could be the top story on the evening news, or it could be, you know, a hashtag on Twitter or whatever. But secondly, like, the language doesn't have to be this way. It's so routine, routinized. It's partly convention. There are also good reasons why, you know, Somebody would say one person instead of mom and a baby. They really don't know who got killed 24 hours after the event. I don't want to dismiss those ideas, but it's not like the AP went back and did a follow-up story. <laughs> you know, it's not like they're like, it's one person today, but in a week, I'm going to get to the bottom of it and tell you exactly what happened. Nope. You get that story and that's the end of it, unless a human rights organization wants to make a case, right? And and that's the the big question that we're really interested in, in some ways. It's like, when do you actually zoom in on the suffering for who? And when do you not, when does it not matter? And as you can see, for most of our violence, especially U.S. drone violence, we don't zoom in at all, or very rarely do we do so. I have so many different thoughts that are kind of swirling around right now, but the main one was kind of focused on that 
that question of uh, genre more than anything else, right? About the degree to which this is that if somebody from the Associated Press was was to read this and say, well, we are constrained by what we can write here or like the by the kind of genre that we are reporting here versus the American prospect where you have a little bit more editorial freedom to do this kind of reporting. But I did want to, I mean, beyond that, I did want to hear a little bit more if you could talk about when you are starting the article, one of the things that I thought was really interesting was that you kind of set up this tension about the kind of journalistic practices that you are, I would say, advocating for through this, where, you know, you explicitly call out the Associated Press for, you know, encouraging this kind of violent nationalist U.S.-based ideology that dehumanizes victims, that strips them of agency, that more or less kind of gives, gives a, a cover to the U.S. military machine and its actions uh, elsewhere in the world. But Lily Chuliaraki, who we mentioned before, also talks about the risks of relying on these kind of grand emotions when you are providing what you call a proximal perspective of this war, telling the story from the perspective of Nabila and what she is doing, going back in time to talk about her reminiscences from earlier in the day. Could you talk a little bit about what are the trade-offs of doing that kind of reporting? Is it always good to advocate for doing that proximal reporting or trying to report something from a perspective very close to a reader's didactic center, or are there some risks involved with that as well? John said this earlier, but one of the ways that we were framing this was through maximum variation. So we have an example that's very distant, and we have an example that's very close. And we're not necessarily advocating for one over the other, but we're pointing out that these are effects that happen. And the that kind of routinized genre point that you're making, Alex, is something that, again, to point back to what John said, something that we want to challenge. We don't have to make it so that people who are dying in war go to the back of the page. We can we can bring them to the front of A1, right? It's not to say that we always have to do that. It's just to say that sometimes, you know, we, we, we fall victim to thinking that because journalistic practices are routinized, that they're determined. And that's not true. We can, we can, represent suffering in different ways. And that actually has a, a meaningful effect. Yeah, one thing that I'll I'll throw in is that there was a drone strike that killed two Westerners. It was accidentally. They were being held hostage. It was an American and an Italian hostage being being held and they they didn't know they were in the building and they accidentally killed them. The reporting suddenly became very dramatic in the same ways that we see in the American prospect. Suddenly, we were hearing stories about the victims. It didn't last for very long, even in that case. But you could see, like, when you want to tell the story that way, you do it. And because no one no one gives them, like, the cue, they just know, like, oh, okay, now these people matter, right? Now they, they are socially and racially and, you know, economically significant enough to tell a story about them in a way that we should care, right? So I think... Once you start looking at the, the discourse in a broad way, you see like, this isn't just a matter of genre. It's not just like, well, I'm constrained by my genre. It truly is a matter of, well, what do I actually think about these victims and the worth of their lives? And I will just add this as a, a thought experiment. If there were a drone strike that happened on U.S. soil that killed a grandmother in her garden, just imagine what the reporting would look like, right? It, it would. There's no way it would be like, you know, I don't know, Al Qaeda drone strike kills one person, <laughs> you know, even if they didn't know who it was immediately, we would, it would be around the clock, you know, we'd be losing our fucking minds and rightly so. So it's, it's a, I think it's somewhat convenient to say like, well, there's a genre at work here and I'm constrained by it. As true as that is, I don't think it's the only straw that's stirring the drink. So yeah, that's where I would go with that. And then you, there was a second part to your question, Alex, and now I've kind of lost the thread. No, that's okay. I, I was more asking about the kind of trade-offs that you get from, right. and I mean, I think that you spoke to it a little bit with the with the, the American prospect reporting of giving a sort of up close and personal perspective, focusing on visceral emotions and sensory experiences. If there is a sort of trade-off in doing that, rather than doing that kind of detached, quote unquote, objective distal perspective that we see from the AP. Yeah, Chuli Araki talks about some of these trade-offs. And I don't really necessarily see it in the American prospect, but I'll, I'll list them just for the sake of, of doing so. Like one is like fetishizing the suffering, right? Like the suffering becomes this almost aesthetic thing that we can 
take stock of and, and view as almost beautiful in a way and it's kind of disturbing and you sometimes see that another is like you know talking about our suffering rather than theirs and you actually do see this a lot in u.s reporting about drone strikes like barack obama was furious about the, the civilians that got killed in this drone strike he felt really fucking bad right like making it about how we feel about their suffering right and making sort of putting their suffering through the prism of how it how it affects our emotions, which is, you know, grotesque. But I think the things that we talk about in our conclusion are more to do with like, you know, when is this going to work to kind of motivate people to see the war as bad? And one of the things that we talk about is like, well, it doesn't really work before the war starts because there aren't victims yet, right? It doesn't really work too when the victims are not pure, perfect victims like Mama Nabibi was, right? A totally innocent person, right? What if what if the victim is like somebody who hates the United States, who is hanging out with actual terrorists, but isn't a terrorist themselves? Are we still going to care about them and tell this kind of up close story? In my work, it doesn't really seem like that's the case. And then the last bit is kind of like this story allows you to focus in, but it doesn't allow you to get take a step back. Right. So that's the other kind of challenge, I guess, of this kind of reporting is it's not just one person that this is happening to. It's a lot of people. And it's not just that people are getting killed or injured. They're they're getting psychologically terrorized, right, and dominated by these drone strikes. And I guess being able to see something at scale uh, while also not missing the nuances of the suffering that make it uh, real and dramatic for you is something that uh, it would be interesting to see if reporting can do that well. Kind of on that point as well, right? So one of the things that you also get from the AP story it, presumably is a lot of other stories that are similar that sound exactly the same. So you can start to, you know, do that kind of mental calculation and counting in your head in order to see how many victims there are, et cetera, et cetera. With the, but there's an irony here too, which is that with the case of Mama Nabibi, we, we actually get a much better kind of coverage temporally. It goes, it goes on longer. We get to see the aftermaths. We get to see the, the, what life was like before Mama Nabibi was, was murdered. <laughs> so you, you get a, a lot more information and you get a lot, a lot of understanding of that particular kind of use case, right? And that case study influences the way that you're going to be thinking about other victims of drone strike in the future, but in a, in a different way, right? So in the one case, we get the kind of tallying, it's kind of set up to help us to tally. In the other case, it's kind of help helping us to understand like, what is, what does that mean to us that this person was killed? I really appreciate that, Cameron. There's, there is kind of this inherent trade-off where the American prospect piece is so rich and so detailed that it kind of can't scale in the same way that the reporting for the AP can. And and I think you're getting at kind of the the way that many, many stories like the AP one create this broader discourse around US foreign policy as being clinical and detached. And the fact that it's so remarkable to get a story like the American Prospects is kind of part of the problem. And maybe that's systemic across journalism and how conflicts like this are covered. But I think that gets to where we wanted to wrap things up, which is thinking about how this framework could possibly be applied to other kinds of case studies. So obviously, right now, we're experiencing a really devastating war in the Middle East in the Gaza Strip with Israel waging war against Hamas in that region. And that's something that we've covered on a little bit on recent Reaver episodes and thinking about how critical discourse studies concepts can be applied to it. Another conflict that I see this framework is extremely relevant to is the Russia and Ukraine war. And so I wondered if any of you have thoughts on the application of this to other contexts. And we'd love to hear from all three of you if if you have thoughts on further applications of this. Yeah, I think I'll I'll preface this by saying we haven't studied those conflicts directly. So I'm basing what I'm gonna say, at least what I've read as sort of the you know, if not prototypical, then somewhat prototypical news consumer, right? I actually think it's, you brought up both Ukraine, the Russia, Ukraine, as well as Israel, Gaza. I actually think they're kind of mirrors of each other. So what I noticed in the reporting on Gaza was that initially we were getting these very clinical, detached pictures of the victims. Meanwhile, the the, the victims of the initial 
terrorist attack in Israel, those victims were told in a very humanizing, close way where we could see their suffering in detail. But as the war progressed, as Israel's siege on Gaza has continued, I think that reality kind of like somehow forced its way into people's minds, right? The stories eventually found their way in and the images help to kind of create that proximity. And as at least for me on Twitter, they're inescapable. And you do start to see these very humanizing narratives of particular individuals with names and ages who have backstories, who suffer long after the traumatic event of the violence. Those stories are emerging now much more so. I think in Ukraine, it's almost been the opposite, right? So initially, and we were working on our article as as Russia invaded Ukraine, initially we got very up close and personal stories of Ukrainian victims. Uh, in a way that to us was like, this is very different than what happens in Yemen, <laughs> right? And uh, these people seem to matter suddenly. And at the time, you also saw people literally saying, like, these victims look like us, like white people, right? Like, so yeah, there was definitely that baggage going along. But I think as that war has sort of receded into the background, especially as the Israel assault on Gaza has taken center stage, those you get more of the you know, there was another strike today. Russia hit this, you know, civilian infrastructure or Ukraine struck back. At, so you get that more clinical kind of this is what happened reporting. Uh, and I think, you know, to your point before, I think it tallies things up and it it cr- it creates this sort of like cost benefit kind of framing of everything. Like this number of people have died and they're not supposed to have died because they're civilians, but this number of baddies have died and that's okay because they're bad people and they should die. Right. I, I think that's where you end up in this very kind of like political, real politic kind of calculus kind of reporting. And it'll be interesting to see if if that changes going forward. I just wanted to throw in real quick, and and this is not to kind of like sound conspiratorial to to any degree, but like it is interesting to see the way that U.S. military funding and or at least a foreign foreign aid funding almost kind of follows this similar like distal and proximal cycle as well. Right. When you have lots of the need for a justification for lots of foreign aid to be sent to a place like Ukraine, we get a lot of that up close, personal, proximal reporting. And then when all of a sudden now we are, you know, shifting foreign policy or foreign aid over to Israel and to some degree now Gaza attempting to get aid into the Gaza Strip, that we are seeing that kind of reverse thing happening. So I don't know. I was curious to, I just wanted to, when you said that, John, that kind of made me think of that as well. And it's not to not to sound conspiratorial, but I think you're right that generally the tide of U.S. foreign policy as it is dictated from the people working in the, in the State Department and elsewhere kind of does trickle down into the way that this is reported. I think your work shows that. Yeah. One of the things that we were talking about um, initially with the invasion of Ukraine was the ways that uh, uh, foreign proxies get set up, right? Um, uh, through through the kinds of ways that you're thought to think about particular kinds of victims as being like you. Um, and, you know, it, I'm uh, my family comes from the Middle East. I'm no stranger, you know, to Islamophobia, to to being excluded from being white. And you you saw that a lot first with Russia and Ukraine, and now especially with with uh, Israel and Gaza. And one of the things that I think is really telling is we're getting a, a really detailed and oftentimes for me at least a little bit too detailed because it it really does affect me. It really does hurt me. We're getting really detailed pictures and stories of victims who are majority children. So it's 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 really hurtful <laughs> in a way that I think does kind of grab your attention. But there, you know, kind of like that flip side, sometimes you start to avoid things that hurt too much. I'm not the only person who's had to take social media breaks because I, I can't go online and see pictures of people who look like my nephews, you know, lying dead on the street. And it's it's just very hurtful. So, you know, one of the things that that has been really influential with this work, you know, this is this is stuff that I think about is having a a kind of way of understanding how reporting and representation of victims influences my perspective as well. Thank you for that, Cameron. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Alex wanted to give you a chance to respond as well. Yeah, of course. So both John and Cameron have had points that I wholeheartedly agree with. And I think 
when I think about especially the the conflict in between Israel and Gaza, I think about how the the American prospect story not only reports the death of Mamana Bibi, but also reports on the suffering of her family as a result of her death and the suffering of the other victims of the strike, just as you know, injured victims. And when you get a report like the AP, you don't really you don't really hear the grief of of those relationships of those families. You don't you just hear one person was killed and all concept of feeling, you know, of like how the, the that person's family might feel, that person's friends might feel, the repercussions of that death just it, it just isn't there. It's not in that thematic, you know, description. What the the up close zoomed in view that the American prospect takes, what that offers us is the much bigger picture of this type of suffering, the suffering of the families, the suffering of the injured. And and I think as you know, when when the conflict started, the reporting on the suffering in Gaza was very schematic, very similar to the the AP story, very schematic, very much this strike happened, this, this many people were killed. But as the conflict and as the war has gone on, you get deeper and deeper and you learn more about the different kinds of suffering that these people are experiencing, not only the death of their loved ones, but entire lines, entire lineages, homes being leveled. It's, and you, you don't get that with, with the AP schematic reporting. And so that's something that I've been thinking about a lot with how these articles and this type of journalism can apply to, to, to that conflict, especially. One thing I just wanted to add is you also see a difference in how people perceive of the war. The polling now shows majorities against the bombing in Gaza. And this is not to it this is not to diminish what Cameron said about how this harms the people who have to deal with seeing these pictures and hearing these stories. And that's another risk that we didn't really touch on as much before, you know, fatigue, feeling helpless, feeling like you can't do anything feeling like trauma yourself, even if you are a distant observer of somebody else's suffering. But that also does motivate people. And I think among the large majority of the population now, there is visceral outrage among at least a hardcore segment of it and overall a rejection of the policy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with that too. And I guess, you know, the only other question I wanted to ask was if you see any applications to domestic politics of this framework, because something I was thinking about a lot living here in Seattle, you know, the ways in which unhoused people are written about and talked about, it's often some of the same kind of distancing. And I just wanted to throw that in if, if anyone had thoughts on domestic political applications. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, one of the things that uh, I kept thinking about as I was doing this, and again, it was just sort of the timing of it was the, the Black Lives Matter movement, right? And particularly police brutality and violence and, uh, you know, say their names, right? You know, where does that come from? It comes from feeling like you've been anonymized, feeling like your suffering is not being recognized, acknowledged, you know, narrated in a way that people can understand it. And so I see major uh, parallels between the sort of effort to get sort of marginalized group suffering, sort of before the public for consideration here at home. If anything, it's even harder for people in, in Pakistan and Yemen to, to make that, you know, make inroads on that. But I think, yeah, so that was the first one that came to my mind, but I think probably others could make other connections. I've been thinking a lot about harm reduction specifically. So, I mean, I, I'm, I myself am vegan. I think about the welfare of animals a lot. Uh, and I, I think about ethics and also the welfare of people. It's part of my vegan ethic as well. I've also been listening to a lot of discussions having to do with harm reduction. And there's a there's a shift or a schism within that discourse right now pertaining to who gets to, to, to talk or whose stories matter. And what I mean... In the humanities, people have talked about this kind of stuff in terms of witness, who gets to bear witness. But one of the things that I found really interesting is that for that community in particular, and the kind of work that they do, that kind of stance that they take as to who who gets to who gets to talk or who, whose 
whose suffering gets to be represented and how, like what kind of narrative we're, we're continuing with <laughs> this discussion of, of needle exchange or, or whatever, actually influences the policies that they, they use, right? So at least within domestic communities or domestic issues. So unhoused people is a, another great example. In Albuquerque, where I used to live, there was supposed to be a tiny home community that would help people who were houseless at the time have a permanent address so that they can apply for jobs. And then the kind of communication shifted tremendously based on the the, the mayor, Tim Keller, I think, promised to, to build this tiny home community in like Northeast Albuquerque, which is a more affluent area. And then suddenly it was like, this many people are going to be moving here, right? And the kinds of stories about, you know, well, you know, houseless people suffer unique kinds of barriers, like they don't have permanent addresses to be able to apply for jobs. Those get completely ignored. So, I mean, I've been interested in the, the ways that like when we read or listen to something, we kind of get interpolated or we kind of get um, turned into the the, the kind of... Um, person for a policy and how that kind of secret policy is being uh, transmitted or built into the identity that you're being asked to entertain. Yeah, it reminds me of a really great article from the Journal of Sociolinguistics from almost two decades ago by Gabriella Modan about the construction of public toilets in different neighborhoods and the way that dialectics are uh, are are forged this kind of sp what she calls a spatial purification practice and the kind of you know you see people's hackles raise up when there is this the sense of somebody some outside force, even if they are people that live in your town, who are encroaching on your sort of domestic pure space, which I think is really a, a visceral and provocative example of that as well. Alex, I wanted to give you a chance to respond as well. Yeah, I, again, agree with both John and Cameron's perspectives. And, and I also feel like I think about climate change, too, and how that's reported and how, I mean, Schematically, we talk about climate change in a whole lot of different ways and how, you know, the effects that climate change is having on everyday weather, food, water security or water insecurity. And and I think, you know, stories I have read stories about how, you know, um, island communities, island nations are affected by rising sea levels, which a lot of people domestically just aren't aware of those impacts. We just hear climate change, the schematic descriptions. Um, but it, it takes those types of deep, zoomed-in perspective-taking stories to really make us aware of what this schematic problem actually means for a lot of people. And, and domestically, you know, it also climate change impacts the, the water available in especially the Western United States and, and on Native land as well. We don't see these issues as being relevant or important when they're schematically discussed. And it's much less motivating for us to take a stance on them. But when they're discussed in a much more zoomed in picture, it's there's something we can take action on. It brings our attention to specific instances that we can have an impact on. One thing really quickly at the end, there's a, a psychologist who, his name is Paul Bloom, who wrote this book called Against Empathy. And one of the things that he warns against is that you're a lot worse at reasoning when you empathize. And oftentimes when you need solutions to systemic problems, looking at specific case studies of victims of that problem, aren't, that's not going to be super helpful. So you need to be able to detach or be more mindful of the problem instead. And I think that that's one of the things that we kind of were trying to do as well, not to say we we prefer one or the other, but we also recognize that we can take a distant or proximal perspective. We can we can step out or we can zoom in, and that ability of being mindful of that is something that is really important for us to be able to reason about the the news that we're consuming or the ways that things are being represented to us. I really like that. It's almost like seeing the two as as rhetorical resources for coming up with better solutions to these problems, right? And that we tend to default to one or the other. And one or the other, I mean, pr primarily the, sch the schematic zoomed out view is the one that we prefer when it comes to U.S. foreign policy, because that allows it to just run on autopilot, but that we need to be able to both zoom in and detach as ways of thinking through these problems. Yeah. And I would just add in really quickly, like, especially when it comes to experiences that we don't normally have, like, so a doctor who's 
operating on somebody needs to be really detached, right? They can't actively at the moment that they're operating, try to experience the pain with the person that they're operating on. But they also do need to know like what pain is and to understand that they don't want to put their patient in pain. And they understand pain because they experience it, right? But most people in the United States have no idea what a drone strike is really like, right? We don't have a frame of it except through the media. And so like, if you never get the sort of close up perspective, then you really, and you're only talking about it in abstract ways, and you really don't know what the fuck you're talking about. You know what I mean? So I think especially insofar as an experience is not one that we already have a frame for, we need to kind of get those up close viewed pictures of to, to even understand what it is that we should be thinking about in more abstract terms eventually. Yeah, I really appreciate all of you giving us, I mean, we, we almost kind of ended on a directions for future research kind of paragraph here if we're thinking about this like an article. But I do think that, I mean, you're you're really illustrating well the kind of potential that this framework has for thinking about the way that discourse space constructs these kind of construals in our mind of certain issues, who is going through them, and what our proximity to it is, to what degree we should care and can do something about it. So we do have to wrap things up here now, but we want to just say thank you one more time to John Otto, Cameron Mozafari, and Alex Kirsch. Thank you all so much for being with us here. We really appreciate your insights on the podcast today. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you for having us. And from all of us here at Reverb, thank you for joining us, dear listener. We will come back at you again with more Reverb soon. But in the meantime, take care, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Our show today was produced by Alex Helberg and Calvin Pollock, with editing work by Calvin. Reverb's co-producers at large are Ben Williams, Sophie Wadzak, and Olivia Burnett. You can subscribe to Reverb and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Android, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Check out our website at www.reverbcast.com. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, where our handle is at ReverbCast. That's R-E-V-E-R-B underscore C-A-S-T. If you've enjoyed our show and want to help amplify more of our public scholarship work, please consider leaving us a five-star review on your podcast platform of choice and tell a friend about us. We sincerely appreciate the support of our listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in.